Come to podcast coming at you live from the OC Rock Radio Studios at Saddleback College. I'm Nick Nina. I'm Jared Smith. And we have a great show for you this morning, afternoon, whenever you're listening. Doesn't matter. Uh, NFL draft happened last weekend, uh, so we're excited about that. Obviously, you saw how much coverage we put into it uh, leading up to the draft, and we will continue that after the draft with some post-draft analysis and all that stuff. There's a lot of crazy things that happen during this draft, so we definitely are going to talk about that. And of course, the NBA playoffs and all their craziness is going on, so those are pretty much the primary topics we're going to dive into today, but of course, we're going to start with the NFL draft. Jared, first of all, give me your take on the whole weekend and how you enjoyed the NFL draft, or didn't enjoy the NFL draft. Oh, I definitely enjoyed it. Uh, I was able to watch the majority of the draft, uh, definitely the entire first round, which is uh, probably the, the biggest show of the entire weekend as far as uh, coverage and that type of thing. And then uh, I was able to watch most of the, the later rounds, four through seven. But um, I love the entire draft. For me, being a football junkie, this is just one step closer to getting to the NFL season. Uh, and obviously, you know, as, as a fan of the Cowboys, I wanted to see who they were going to pick. But also, it's fun and interesting, especially this year, uh, with so much up in the air, debating who was going to go number one. I had Sam Donald going number one all along. There's a lot of people that had Josh Allen. Um, I'm sure there are people who had uh, Josh Rosen even, uh, but it ended up being Baker Mayfield, yeah. who I don't think many of us thought was going to go number one up until uh, a few days before the draft. There started to be some rumors and rumblings that, that Mayfield uh, was very high on the Browns list, and he ended up going number one. Uh, and then at number four, because the Browns had two first-round picks, uh, many people thought that they would take Bradley Chubb, mm -hmm. uh, who in most people's eyes was the best defensive end uh, pure pass rusher in the draft, and then taking Denzel Ward, the cornerback from Ohio State, who is really, really good, um, but I think in the end, it just wasn't the way that we thought the draft would start. No, definitely um, not. So with that, you know, a lot of other good players fall, um, and, and that obviously shapes the way that the draft gets started. So uh, it was great, a lot of intrigue, a lot of excitement. Um, uh, the, the Giants take Saquon Barkley at number two. Yep. Uh, you know, so that'll be interesting for my Cowboys to go up against him twice a year. That'll be really fun. But uh, no, it, I, I love the draft. It was in Dallas this year. I think they did a really good job with that. I know we might talk about this a little bit later, but uh, uh, Akers, the, the Philadelphia yeah, Eagles former kicker, came that. out and <laughs> and uh, you know was, was giving the Cowboys a lot of a lot of smack and just like uh, Drew Pearson did last year when the draft was in Philly. So. You know, a lot of different fun angles to it, but uh, no, it, it was great, and I uh, can't wait to dive into it. Yeah, I had a good time watching the draft. Uh, the first day, I kind of made a party out of it, really enjoyed that day, had a drinking game, uh, then ended up costing me the next morning, <laughs> uh, let's just say that, and, uh, but it was fun. Uh, I did I did not be, I wasn't able to pay attention to the second day as much. Uh, I know who people picked, but I wasn't really able to pay attention to it, and I actually watched most of the third day. Uh, and saw the whole stuff with uh, Shaquille Griffin and all that, or Shaquem Griffin, and all that stuff later in the day. Uh, I, I always like draft. I always, I actually thought it went really quick. It was like it was like over like that. Like uh, it, it seems like the last couple of years, it's kind of gone on and on and on. Uh, but uh, it just it seemed like it actually went too fast for me. So yeah, I, I mean like, the every team in the first round gets ten minutes to pick. Yeah, I believe the second and third rounds you get uh, either seven minutes or five minutes. And then rounds four through seven, they kind of just roll them it's out. Like I mean, you get fire, yeah, yeah, you get like two, three minutes maybe, be, just because there's so many. I mean, there's two hundred and fifty six picks. Yeah. So obviously, day one is a big deal. So they they prolong it a little bit more. It's like three, almost four hours. But we, yeah, when you get to those later rounds, five, six, seven, it's they're just churning them in. So it, that's I think that's one of the reasons why it goes a little bit faster. Yeah, no, totally, and. Uh... But uh, overall, it was good. It was fun to watch. Uh, but a lot of interesting picks. And the first pick might have been the most interesting of the night, to be honest. The whole draft. Uh, Baker Mayfield going number one. When Roger Dale came out to his resounding boos like he usually does to start this draft, uh, I was excited. I was like, who are the Browns going to pick? Because we had heard these rumors. We even talked about it on the podcast. There were so many rumors about Baker Mayfield possibly going number one. We said, that's a bad idea. Sam Darnold's the best quarterback. And what do the Cleveland Browns do? <laughs> they pick Baker Mayfield number one. Man, I, I shouted with the people I was watching. We all shouted and we're like, what? You know, some expletives came out after that. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was an interesting pick. I don't, I'm just going to say it. I don't agree with it. 
Uh, I don't think they should have got Mayfield. I think Sam Darnold's a more um, safer pick. I think Sam Darnold, let's just say this, he looks like one of those quarterbacks that even if he's not an absolute star like an Aaron Rodgers or a Tom Brady or a Peyton Manning, I still think he's going to be an extremely productive quarterback in the NFL and won't be a complete bust. Baker kind of has that thing to him where he could be a bust or he could be a Drew Brees. And I think if you're the Browns and you've had so many quarterback faults the last couple of years, I mean, how many quarterbacks have they had? 60 quarterbacks in the last 15 uh, I years? I mean, like... I mean, it's not even that much of a stretch. <laughs> so... I think uh, it's more like 20. It's but more okay. like 20, yeah. It's a, but uh, nonetheless, they should have picked a safer pick. And Sam Darnold was the safer pick. This the safest pick out of all the quarterbacks. If they would pick Josh Rosen number one, I would have been like, what are you doing? You know, if they would pick Josh Allen number one, I would be like, what are you doing? And when they picked Baker Mayfield, I was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so uh, I thought they should have picked Darnold. Not only did Darnold not go number one, but he dropped all the way to three. Not mad at the New York Giants for that necessarily. They already have a QB. But, uh, yeah, very interesting. I want to get your take on Baker Mayfield. Yeah, no, I mean, first of all, how happy are the Jets to get Sam Darnold oh, at number three? So happy. Are you kidding me? Ridiculous. Like, yeah. they, I think they had their sights set on Baker Mayfield because I think they even assumed that the Browns would take Darnold or one yeah. of the other quarterbacks. And then even if you're the Giants at number two, listen, I, I understand that, you know, all the Giants coaches and, and personnel are coming out and saying that Eli Manning is still our guy, which I think for this upcoming season he is. Um, but people are saying he has two to three years left in him. I'm not so sure about that. I think he can because, I mean, his, his he's really only missed, I think, one game yeah. um, throughout his whole career. So, yes, he, you know, durability is not an issue for him, but I think they also have to look towards the future. And if you were to get a quarterback of the future, you know, your franchise quarterback for the next 10, 15 years, this was the draft to do it. So totally. I think they did miss on taking uh, <clears throat> Sam Darnold or one of these other quarterbacks. Now, I'm not trying to throw any shade at Saquon Barkley because he's clearly one of the best athletes uh, and running backs in this draft. So I understand why you want to surround Eli with talent. But I think the, the running back depth in this draft was really, really good. Yes. And they could have gotten uh, a Ronald Jones or a Darius Geis or one of these other really good running backs in the second round. Yeah, so, dropped, anyway. Right, right. So I, I don't mean to you know kind of go away from the question that you asked about the Browns. No, no um, but I just want to say I think, I think the Giants, Saquon Barkley is going to be fantastic. And he could end up being a Hall of Famer. But what are the Giants going to do when Eli Manning retires? That I think that's a bigger well, yeah. hole, that's a bigger that's hole to good, fill than the running back. So we'll see how that plays out. Now going back to the Browns, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I I don't think that was the best. I think they should have taken Sam Darnold, and for not obvious reasons, because listen, Baker Mayfield was the Heisman Trophy winner, so it's not like this guy's a scrub, obviously. But the intangibles, uh, uh, Sam Darnold is a little bit bigger. I think he can, you know, when he gets hit, I think he can take some of those hits. Um, I think Baker Mayfield is going to be more susceptible um, to taking shots, and he's going to run more. So he's, he's, I think he's just overall going to take more hits, which, uh, you know, he's a smaller guy. So we'll see if he can handle those. Um, Sam Darnold, I think he, he has a better arm. And I don't mean uh, strength-wise. I mean precision and accuracy. I think he reads where defenders are, and I think he, he throws his receivers open. Uh, I think Baker Mayfield technically has the stronger arm. He could probably make the longer throws. But uh, I just, you know, all around, just kind of quarterback savvy wise, I think Sam Darnold was the, the better choice there. In the end, uh, you know, it's going to take a couple years to really see who is the better quarterback because I don't care if, if both of these big guys, Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold, play well or if they both play horribly this year. Uh, I think we're going to have to give them a couple years until you you can sit here and really give them a, a definitive grade uh, as far as how good they are. Well, let's just say this. I remember when all the trades happened with the Browns, and they got Tyrod, and they got uh, Landry, and all this stuff. And we Carlos thought, Hyde. We, yeah, Carlos Hyde. We actually thought they would get Saquon Barkley eventually. But I remember we were saying, you know what? It's one of the breaks on them a little bit. They're probably going to be a 5-6 win team. They're not going to make the playoffs. Their roster's still not good enough. I think by them picking Baker Baker Mayfield, you can definitely say that they're going to be a 5 to six win team. Sam Darnold, you never know. Maybe he could have really taken the reins. He could have been the star quarterback that would have brought them out of obscurity and they, they might get to that possible playoff spot with Sam Darnold. But with Baker, he's a project I at least think. I don't think he's going to play this year. I think Tyrod's going to be the guy. And so I think for Browns fans, be excited that you're actually going to win more than one game. That's better than what you guys could say the last two years. 
Uh, but you're not going to be a playoff team because your management made it a little more difficult on you by picking Baker Mayfield. Uh, but nonetheless, and I kind of want to talk about this Denzel Ward pick too. I did not when they said when they when they announced Denzel Ward, I was kind of disappointed about that one too. I was like, you guys, we were just talking about this off off uh, broadcast. They could have picked Bradley Chubb, who I think is the best, who I actually thought was the best player in the entire draft. Draft. If you had to pick, if all the teams started from scratch, you're picking Bradley Chubb, number one. Uh, so I thought they, they missed on that one. They could have picked, um, they could have picked Quentin Nelson, another lineman. They, it, it just, I, I thought that uh, the Denzel Ward pick was another stretch, and I don't know why the Browns are picking stretch players. Pick the sure things. You know, your team isn't winning. So I, that's another one. I, I want to kind of get your take. What do you think about the Denzel Ward pick? Yeah, it was uh, it was another one that was kind of a head-scratcher. It, it's like, listen, Denzel Ward is, in my opinion, he was the top cornerback no, He's a great player, list. yeah. Yeah, but when you when you pair Miles Garrett, who was your number one overall pick exactly, last year, yeah. with Bradley Chubb, that instantly makes Ooh. that Browns defensive pass rush um, top three. Top oh, four yeah, in absolutely. the league. It's Clowney and Watt. But right. an even better version of Clowney. Right, because they're younger, more exactly. athletic. I mean, yeah, so I would have done that. And I think you bring up a good point, Quentin Nelson. I would have even drafted him number four. Yeah. Have, have uh, you know, Sam Darnold, in my opinion, if I would have drafted number one. Sam Darnold and Quentin Nelson. Oh, perfect. There's your guard to protect, to keep your quarterback upright. Because we all know that Cleveland quarterbacks, it, listen, for as bad as the actual quarterback play has been, it hasn't been all their fault. It, it's also the offensive line and it's also the weapons or the lack of weapons that the, the Browns have put around their quarterback. So um, I, I will say this, Baker Mayfield is going to get on the field this year. Okay. I, I think Tyrod Taylor will start, and he will play at probably the first half of the season. And then depending on how the season goes, and depending on how Baker Mayfield does in practice, I think Hugh Jackson is, is going to be forced to play him. Um, I think in today's age of football, um, as much as even I've said it before, you know that you would like to – sit these quarterbacks uh, and have them develop, it's, it's kind of a play now league. Um, you know, guys get drafted really high and the expectations are higher than they, they have been in, in recent years. So um, if the Browns, you know, the first eight games go two and six, I think you can, you can bet the house that Mayfield's going to get on the field. If yeah. the Browns are, you know, 500 or even above 500, then I think they probably stick with Tyrod Taylor. But um, in the end, I, I think between the fan base, uh, you know, the, the GM, the owner, everyone, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on Coach Hugh Jackson, who is a quarterback guru and has been an offensive coordinator for multiple other uh, franchises throughout his career and teams. I think he's going to be forced at some point to put his number one overall draft pick on the field, uh, regardless of the, the team's uh, schedule. Yeah, that's a safe prediction. I mean, Tyrod Taylor literally let Nathan Peterman get on the field last year for the Bills uh, in that one game against the Chargers. So it doesn't. It, it it wouldn't shock me if Baker got on the field. I do, I am going to agree with you on that statement though. I think no matter what, he's going to get on the field because I even think if they're five hundred, that's probably not good enough for a team that they probably think has more talent than they do. And they do have more talent. They do. They have way more talent than they had. Like you look at the team three years ago. They have an absorbent amount of talent. Uh, it, it, the, you know, they got some great players. Now they could have had, you know, better with maybe Quentin Nelson or Bradley Chubb or, or something like that. But uh, I do think Baker does get on the field eventually. Whether that hurts or helps him, I don't know. I would say hurt because I think the guy needs to is a little more NFL training as far as being a quarterback. He he's almost that prototypical college quarterback, and a lot of times we've seen the prototypical college quarterbacks not be the best NFL quarterbacks, at least right away. So uh, I think he will get on the field, but I don't know if that's the best for him. Now, uh, Jerry, anything you want? Anything else you want to talk about in the top five? As uh, far as picks? You know, I, listen. I think that the Broncos were able to get Bradley Chubb at number five. Yeah, good. So you pair him with Von Miller. I mean, listen. That that's that's like a you know Demarcus Ware, uh, but a younger version. So oh, yeah. I Bradley think that's a beast. I think that defense got a lot better, even though their secondary. Uh, you know, lost to keep to Um I, They still have Bradley Roby, Chris Harris Jr. So I think that that defense is going to get back to the elite status um, that it was. Even though they were still good last year, uh, they, I think they can get back to that Super Bowl championship defense that they had a couple years ago. So um, I think that was a really good pick for them. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, obviously, I think the Browns surprised us all. Uh, the Giants, you know, I can't be mad at them for taking Saquon Barkley. 
but I think they should have gone quarterback. Um, but yeah, the Browns were was definitely uh, with both of their picks. Very, very surprising in the top five. I, I have to agree with, with all of those statements you just said. But let's move on to a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And it's the Arizona Cardinals quest for a quarterback. And they finally did it, Jared. They finally drafted the quarterback. And it's our own. It's our own local. Josh Rosen is going to the Arizona Cardinals. I was ecstatic when they picked this pick. Not only because I think I had, if you guys remember my mock draft, I had Josh Rosen as the number two quarterback getting drafted by the New York Giants. I still think they should have picked him because I think Rosen's really good. Uh, but not only that, not only did the Cardinals get a, get a quarterback of the future, but it's a guy that like I've been following for the last like six years. You know, this guy dominated at St. John Bosco. If you've heard of how good St. John Bosco is at high school football, the reason is is because Josh Rosen went there six years ago and started to play there. So, uh, and then of course he went to UCLA. As you guys know, I'm a UCLA fan as well, especially in football. And so to see a guy, a local guy especially, get drafted by the Cardinals, that was extra cool. But I'll get my bias out of it. I think the Cardinals made a good pick here, obviously. They still have Sam Darnold as their starting cornerback, so they have that safety net starting. Josh Rosen does not need to jump right in, uh, like let's say Josh Allen is going to have to in Buffalo. Um, they still have uh, they still have Mike Lennon as a as a NFL quarterback backup. So Josh Rosen will be able to develop in Arizona under his a, a brand new coaching staff. Um, and the Cardinals asked, also drafted him a center in the third round, so he's going to kind of have that rapport with the center. Uh, he will get to throw to Larry Fitzgerald. He'll get to give the ball off to David Johnson in practice. I think this was the perfect place, to be honest, for Josh Rosen to uh, end up in, even though I had him going to the Giants. When you look at it and the way the Cardinals drafted, I actually do think this was the best place for Josh to land. And it was kind of crazy how he ended up did landing to the Cardinals at number 10. They had to trade up and really didn't trade that much up to get him. I'm excited, Jared. I want to get the unbiased take from you necessarily. Because yeah, uh, I, I think this, uh, this pick had to be made by the Cardinals because of what had happened in the first nine picks. Uh, you saw the Bills jump up to number seven. They traded up to get their guy, uh, Josh Allen. And obviously, the Browns took Baker Mayfield at one, and the Jets took Sam Darnold at three. So right there, you already have three of the top four quarterbacks, in most people's opinion, gone. So for the Cardinals, it's, okay, we either roll the dice with Sam Darnold and Mike Glennon and, you know, potentially get our quarterback of the future next year or in two years, or we move up now and take uh, the last of the elite quarterbacks in this draft. So for me, not to say that they obviously didn't have their eyes on Josh Rosen, but I think they had to do this. They had to move up regardless of what they had to give up to the Oakland Raiders. Um, I'm surprised that Oakland didn't ask for more um, because if, if I'm Oakland and I'm sitting there, I realize that there's quarterbacks already off the board. Yeah. And the Cardinals, you know, they're, they're kind of sweating to do this right now. So I think the Cardinals actually came out of this with, with the ultimate win, not giving up as much and getting who they think will be their franchise quarterback. Um, I've had my doubts about Rosen and not necessarily – about his play on the field because I think he's the best pure pocket passer. Um, I, I, I think all four of these top elite quarterbacks you know, have something that they're, they, they specialize in. Um, for Rosen, I think he's just the best pure passer. He can make all of the NFL throws, the, the 12-yard outs, uh, the deep passes, the precision, all of that stuff I think he's fantastic at. The, the issue that I've always had with him um, is, is mentally. Um, is he always about football being you know the 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 center of the franchise the the future quarterback and, and future guy you have to like live breathe everything football and there have been some reports and some rumblings that he's not always about football you know he, he's not always the the first guy in and the last guy to leave he's not always you know, watching film like you would expect franchise quarterbacks to do. So I think that's where I, I somewhat have my doubts about him. Now, um, I think him being with Larry Fitzgerald and the, and the veteran and future Hall of Famer that he is, hopefully Larry can, you know, sit him down and say, hey, listen, Rook, if you want to be great, this is what you need to do. I played with Kurt Warner. I played with other really good quarterbacks. I know what it takes to get to a Super Bowl. I know what it takes to win. So hopefully 
uh, Fitzgerald, along with some of the other veterans in the locker room, can can you know help Rosen out as far as um, you know explaining to him and helping him say this is how you need to be a quarterback in the NFL. So um, I, I think it's a good pick, but going back to it, it's I think it's a pick that they had to make. So. Who knows if he was actually their guy, but at the end of the day, with the other three top quarterbacks going, they had the trade-up to get Rosen. Yeah, I mean, I think it was one of the big topics of the draft, are the Cardinals going to finally pick a quarterback? And at, at number 15, it was Lamar Jackson, or it was, oh, do you wait for Mason Rudolph and stuff? And I didn't necessarily like that. Um, I thought Lamar Jackson would have been a fine pick, but I think... Once we saw that Allen went number seven, because I, if you remember, I had um, I had Allen waiting all the way to number eleven. So I, I, you know, I think once Allen went to number seven, it was getting a little bit uh, sketchy for the Cardinals. I think they did the right thing, and our GM Steve Keim uh, does not like to trade up. He doesn't like to give up picks. He, I remember him. He quoted and. And said, I'm, I'm a cheap guy. I don't like to uh, give away assets. So uh, the Cardinals end up with only six draft picks. The last couple of years, we've had seven, eight, nine draft picks where he's been able to trade back because the Cardinals haven't necessarily needed certain things. Uh, but he goes up and he makes a good decision. I think you didn't trade that much. The Cardinals actually gave away a third round pick. They already had one. So they could afford to give that away. And then I think they just threw away their fifth round pick. But um, And of course, they gave the 15th pick to Oakland. But... Uh, I thought it was a good. I thought it was a good thing. It needed to happen, like you said. Uh, but let's discuss this a little bit. We got we got a couple more minutes in this segment. Um, Josh Rosen, the comments after uh, he got picked, he was he was kind of calling out some teams, saying that all nine players drafted above him, or all nine teams would regret it. Uh, it actually was eight teams. The Browns drafted twice, but nonetheless, uh, computer behind us is going nuts. <laughs> um, Nonetheless, uh, back to the back to the football. He makes these comments uh, regarding the quarterbacks and other teams and stuff like this and other players. So, Jared, I wanted to get your take. Do you think this matters, or do you think this is just the same old Josh Rosen kind of talking crap? Uh, you know what? I actually didn't mind that at all. Um, I think that shows uh, the fieriness and the competitiveness that he has, and I, I'm actually okay with that. Um, is it is it cocky? Is it a little too much? I think there's some people that will say that. Um, to me, I think he's he's listen. He is a guy that will say whatever is on his mind. That is one thing I think you can guarantee from him is that he has no problem um, saying what he feels, no matter who it is, no matter where it is, where he is. Um, and I don't think he matters it matters to him if he kind of hurts people's feelings. That's just the way they, that he is. So I'm okay with that. Um, for him, I think he thought that he was the best player in the draft and the best quarterback, so he probably felt that he should go number one to the Browns. And the fact that he, in his mind, slid to the number 10 spot, um, I, listen, I think that's just a, a competitor, and I really have no problem with that statement. Um, it's other things that he's done as far as his you know, his, his football studying and all that stuff that I have a problem with. So, um, I don't, listen... Deion Sanders came out and said that he when he got drafted in like the top five picks when he came out. Um, he came out and said something, and, and don't quote me, but he, he was saying something along the lines of, you know, all these other teams, these top four teams that passed me up, they're going to regret it too. So I think that's just a, a, a fiery spirit, and I'm totally okay with that. And listen, hopefully he does prove these guys wrong, because I'm not sitting here being a Josh Rosen hater. Um, I want the guy to do well. I hope he does play well. Um, I'm just a little skeptical as far as, you know, um, how much is he willing to invest in this sport? Yeah. You know, now that he's going to get paid millions of dollars, he's going to be in the spotlight all the time. This isn't like college anymore. You're, you're, you're a grown man now, right? You're, you're a professional. You're making money. Um, I, I think that's more of the, the issue that I have. So uh, who knows? And really, for, for any of these players, I don't care if you're a first-round draft pick and you slide to number 20, uh, if you're a seventh-round draft pick or an undrafted guy. Um, you, I think you have to have the mentality, unless you're the first round pick, that hey, listen, the, you know the teams that passed on me, they're gonna regret it. You know what I mean? And I, I think that's just fuel to the fire. That's that's how I would be. That's that's the competitive spirit that I have. So I see where Josh Rosen is coming from that point. I did want to ask you one question about Rosen before we wrap this segment up. Do you think Rosen plays this year? I no, I don't think he plays this year. I think the Cardinals have enough weapons. Well, okay, let me say this. 
if if all things work out, I don't think he plays. Uh, I think I, I try not to predict injuries, so I'm not going to say that Sam Sam Bradford's going to get injured. But let's say he gets injured. I think you could possibly see Rosen play in that circumstance. We've seen with the Cardinals the last couple of years, them have quarterbacks that really shouldn't be playing end up playing at the end of the year because of injuries. So no, I don't think Rosen's going to play barring injuries. So I won't predict that he's going to pass up Sam Bradford or Mike Glennon as the, as the quarterback this year, just straight out. But I think if an injury happens, yes, but I'm not going to predict an injury. But that's kind of a morbid thought anyways. But so uh, we're going to get a break. We're going to we're going to continue uh, the draft talk. We still want to talk. I still want to say a little bit more things about Rosen. Uh, and uh, we'll continue. We need to talk about the Cowboys draft as oh, yeah. well. Yes, we uh, will. And a little bit of surprises. So we'll, we'll be right back on the Cover 2 podcast with a little uh, NFL draft and NBA talk. With the first pick in the 2018 NFL draft, the Cleveland Browns select Baker Mayfield. With the third pick in the 2018 NFL Draft, the New York Jets select Sam Darnold, yep. quarterback, USC. So there he is, 20 years old. In other words, almost half the age of Josh McCown going up the steps and adding his name with Teddy Bridgewater to the Jets draft, uh, quarterback room. The third overall pick in the draft is Sam Darnold out of USC. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have traded the seventh pick to the Buffalo Bills. With the seventh pick in the 2018 NFL Draft, the Buffalo Bills select Josh Allen, quarterback, Wyoming. Uh, I was pretty, honestly, I was pretty pissed off as I saw teams going by um, and passing on me. And on, I thought I was going to have to, after about, I'd say, four and five went through, I thought I was going to have to uh, fake a smile and uh, uh, pretend, pretend I was happy. But uh, honestly, the second I got that call, it all went away. And uh, I just basically motivation and determination set in. And uh, I honestly could have walked straight off, that, straight off that stage onto a plane to Arizona and got to work right then. There were nine mistakes made, uh, made ahead of me. And uh, I'll make sure over in the next decade or so that they'll, uh, they'll know they made the mistakes. Cover 2 Podcast back live on OC Rock Radio continuing our NFL draft talk. Uh, Nick had a couple more things he wanted to talk about as Cardinals. Of course, because he's the homer. I'm, we're going I got, to I got, I uh, let him. Today. Yeah, we, we, he's got to get this off his chest. Yeah. He's really, really excited about this pick. Uh, I wanted to dive into a couple things about my Cowboys because, hey, if Nick's going to talk about the Cardinals, <laughs> I got to yeah, talk yeah. about my Cowboys a little 100%. bit. And then uh, towards the end, to wrap up our NFL draft talk, we wanted to talk about a few sleepers who weren't picked in the first round, uh, who we think will have major impacts on these their NFL teams next season. But uh, let's continue our talk with Rosen and uh, let Nick. Finish up. Yeah, I will finish up my bias. Cardinals top. Uh, I just want to say one more thing about Rosen. So you were mentioning his off the field stuff, and and funny enough, if you if you saw the Twitter promoting the show today, you saw there was one picture of Baker Mayfield uh, dancing at Oklahoma, and there was another picture of Josh Rosen in the hot tub in his in his uh, apartment yep, in building. his dorm room yeah, in his dorm room. So I had to post that because I think it, it's it's. I don't want to say the coolest picture of Josh Rosen, but it's the one that I think everyone thinks of when they think of Josh Rosen because a lot of people like to hate him. But um, I mentioned the thing about how he said all the things about the teams. But if you look at him, there is a little bit of that, that edge to him that you don't know if he's 110% in the football. I think he's about 98%. There's a little bit of that stardom in him too. But I, I tend to, when a player will get drafted to the Cardinals, at least some of the top picks, I'll follow him on social media a little bit for the first, you know, maybe for like a month. And then a lot of times I'll get sick of him. I'm like, why am I even following this guy? So I did throw a follow toward Josh Rosen's way. Same with Christian Kirk and some of our other picks. Uh, and Rosen, besides literal like videos that are kind of produced by the Cardinals and all this stuff, the videos of him lately have kind of been just him in his house or him at, in, in his really nice car and stuff like that. And it hasn't necessarily been him on the field. As where Christian Kirk, our second pick, his his videos have been kind of training on the field, stuff like that. So more football I, related. Yeah, exactly. So I think 
You're right. There's a little bit of that stardom in him. I don't think it's enough to where Cardinals fans need to panic. I just think he's a little more uh, of a star than the Cardinals are used to drafting. Let's just say that because they, they've kind of drafted mild-mannered guys or guys with kind of sketchy past that aren't going to be out there throwing their you know throwing stuff away. But um, I do think it'll be fine. I think he realizes that he's in a good position with the Cardinals. He's going to have to wait. He's not going up and saying, "Oh, I'm, I'm going to beat Sam Darl or Sam uh, Bradford for for the the starting role." I'm the Mike Lennon's the third. He's not saying that. Uh, he's saying that he understands his role so far. Hopefully, he's true to that. Uh, I don't think there's that big of a problem. I just wanted to throw that out there though because I did mention that it the all the other picks are kind of talking about football and he's driving Westwood in his car, moving his camera around and stuff like that right, on right. his phone. So. Uh, I just wanted to mention that because it's a personal thing I saw and did notice of him. No, no, that's good. That's good. Uh, let's talk about the Cowboys. Let's a talk bit. about the Cowboys. Yes, and that's just, just for a second. Um, the Cowboys, uh, a lot of mock drafts had them taking a wide receiver, either, yes. either Calvin Ridley or DJ Moore. Uh, especially with the release of Des Bryant, receiver became a much bigger need um, than originally expected going into this draft. Uh, and so with Calvin Ridley, and DJ Moore and the other top receivers all on the board for the Cowboys to pick. What do they do? They pick linebacker Leighton Van Der Esch <laughs> from Boise State. Um, yes. Now, the Cowboys also did have a big need at linebacker after they lost uh, their starting linebacker, Anthony Hitchens, who signed a new free agency deal in Kansas City. So currently, the Cowboys only had two starting linebackers coming back from last year, technically three, uh, Sean Lee, Jalen Smith, and uh, Damian Wilson. Damian Wilson, Wilson was more of a sub package guy. Because the other two are good. Yeah, Smith and yeah. Lee are the, are the main two linebackers, which is great, and I have no problem with the both of them starting, but the depth was not there at all. So um, when the Cowboys first made this pick, I was like, it was, it was kind of like a, I don't know, good thing, bad thing. I was like, okay, cool. We got a really good run, linebacker, but it wasn't that like sexy splashy, you well, know, It wasn't receiver. like how I reacted to Josh Rosen. Right, right, right. Yeah, not yeah. at all. But hey, listen, you know what? Linebackers don't get the, uh, not that they don't get the credit, they just, I don't think, get the, the recognition or the, the star praise that the quarterbacks and the receivers do uh, in football. But I think after, uh, you know, I was able to kind of settle down a little bit and think a little more about it, it was actually a really, really good pick. Um, and with what the Cowboys did later on in the draft, um, I, I think it made a lot of sense why they pick linebacker uh, in the first round. In the second round, they pick Connor Williams, the tackle slash guard from Texas, and the Cowboys did have a need at left guard. So I think that was a big pick because he's very versatile. He can play tackle, he can play guard, they can kind of move him around and uh, really solidify that offensive line, which is the main reason why the Cowboys went 13-3 and two years ago. They had a really solid offensive line. They handed the ball to Zeke about 30 times a game and they didn't put all the pressure on Dak Prescott. So I think that's what they're hopefully trying to get back to this season is run the ball a lot with Zeke, control the clock, keep your defense off the field, um, and you know when the defense is on the field, you know have three and outs, and I think that's, that's the key to success for this team. So in the third round, they finally got their receiver, Michael Gallup, uh, out of Colorado State, um, and he's somewhat of a, a name. He's not as big as Calvin Ridley or DJ Moore was going into the draft, but he's a bigger receiver at about 6'1", uh, he can go up and contest the catch. He's not much of a speed burner, but um, and I'm not trying to say he is Des Bryant, but he can make those type of contested red, red zone, um, you know, touchdown catches. So I think he f it somewhat fills Des Bryant's shoes in that aspect. So um, overall, I was I was pleased with what the Cowboys did as the draft went along. Like I said, I think there's a lot of Cowboys fans, including myself, who were a little skeptical of their their first pick. But as the draft went on, I think they filled a lot of needs. And after the draft, I, I think they're a lot better team than they were before. Now, quick question with you. Um, I believe, did they draft, uh, I might be mistaken on this. Did they draft Bo Scarborough? Yes, they did, well? in the seventh round. See, I think that's a major uh, sleeper. I love dude. that pick. I don't understand how he dropped that far. But that's going to be a nice little compliment to Ezekiel Elliott. Yes, it is. Backfield. It's going to be like a little thunder and thunder, like oh, with yeah. the with the Titans had with Demarco Murray. Oh, and there's no more thunder. And Derek Henry. Bo Scarborough. Oh, yeah, no, that's it's not. almost the exact same thing. I think yeah. one of the reasons why Bo Scarborough fell in the draft was because of his injury history. True. Um, I mean, he was the the bell cow running back for Alabama the last couple of years, and you know when you when you just look at him, you think he's just a big bruiser. I mean. 
he he's like I think he's six foot or six one. So for a running back, he's really tall. Yeah. And I think sometimes he has trouble kind of getting low and and making shoulder contact with linebackers, which is why sometimes he can get tackled ease more easily because guys can go low on him and he can't get that low himself. But um, he will truck you when he needs to, <laughs> and he actually has better speed than most people think. So. After the Cowboys run the ball three, four straight times with Ezekiel Elliott, and we all know the bruising running back that he is, the other teams are going to say, okay, we finally get a break because Zeke's out. No, you don't, because Bo Scarbo is going to come yeah, in, oh, he's and he's even more of a bruiser than Elliott is. So I think that was a really, really Lay good pick by them late in the draft. Um, they still have Rod Smith on the team, uh, who came along late last year. He, he was kind of a, a fullback hybrid running back, so he's another versatile player, plays on special teams a lot. And um, they did have Alfred Morris, who's a free agent, but Alfred Morris still hasn't been signed by a team. So the Cowboys still could bring him, up, bring him back as well. And I think that the running back position uh, is easily going to be one of the strengths of this team going forward. I, I'll say this. I think with this draft, and just amongst the other things, obviously getting Ezekiel Elliott back and stuff like that, I think the Cowboys are going to return to one of the more dominant teams in the NFL next year. I think they drafted well. Um, I do kind of agree with you with the Leighton Van S pick, or Van Der S pick. It's not a sexy pick at all, but I do think it fills a need for you guys. I would have liked, since I, have, I, I had Calvin really going to the Cardinals, I had them not trading away their pick. Uh, but I thought the fact that he was still on the board, I did think you guys probably should have drafted him. Uh, DJ Moore was the guy you mentioned as well. I think the Panthers ended up picking him up. They did. Uh, but... Um, so yeah, I was a little disappointed you guys didn't pick Calvin really, and then he goes to. We'll, we'll maybe talk about this a little later. He goes to Atlanta. Wow, and Julio oh Jones my, over there. Are you oh kidding? my goodness, Are you they kidding? have so much talent over there. Get out of here. Um, but uh, so I didn't think they missed on that. But I think you're right. You you make a good point. They did they do fill a need, and that linebacking core is now very very solid. Not much depth, but very solid. For right the at the top, they're very very yeah, solid. And one more thing about the Cowboys, and and you're gonna hate me for doing this, but. Do you know what that wide receiver from Colorado State is going to do when he scores a touchdown? Uh, what's he going to do? He's going to gallop into the end zone. Uh, yeah. Oh, boy. That's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. That's... I know. I was thinking about it. I had to say it. I had to say it. Michael Michael Gallup. Wow. All right. <laughs> yeah. That's going on. Thanks, the, Nick. It's going on the post year. Uh... <laughs> bloopers. Yeah, bloopers. Sound bites uh, of the year. Uh, so I wanted to mention anything else you want to mention about your Cowboys though, so we don't leave off on that stupid. Comment. <laughs> yeah, we can't leave off on that. No, no. Uh, overall, like I said, I think they, I think they did really well. I, not that I forgot about Bo Scarbo, but he was a seventh round pick, so you know he's not the first. That's guy how I wanted that to bring him up. Of, I was like, I don't think he's going to bring him up. So. Right? No, no. I, I think what the Cowboys did in this draft, I don't want to say that they got like a, a home run player. Uh, like a Calvin Ridley or a, a franchise quarterback because they already have one. But I, what I think they did is they filled a lot of needs. And and listen, the Cowboys were already a good team. So now with these more of these needs being filled and more depth being added to the roster, um, I, I think they really do have a solid chance to get back to that 13 and three, 12 and four mark, um, and, and you know hopefully win the division and get themselves back into the playoffs because I think they have the talent to do it. Now they have a, a pretty tough schedule ahead of them this season, um, but I, I think uh, talent-wise, and maybe this is me being a homer or not, I think they have a solid chance of winning the NFC East and, and getting back to the playoffs. No, I think that could happen, and I, I don't think you guys drafting Michael Gallup is a good pick because you did lose Jess Bryant, so you did need, need to field that role. I would be disappointed in the Cowboys if they hadn't drafted the wide receiver. Let's say earlier um, in the in the draft, let's say they go up and pick a, a guy up in the seventh round that's not necessarily uh, filling in for Des Bryant, but I do think your defense isn't as good as it was two years ago, but I think that's fine. I think it's good enough. I think the offense improved. I think the Cowboys are going to make the playoffs. I'll just say it right now. Bar, like I said with the, the whole Josh Rosen, Sam Bradford thing, barring an injury uh, or a crazy suspension, an unjust suspension like last year, the Cowboys are making the playoffs this year. They're a good team, and you're not being a homer. They, they, you are just correct on that prediction. All right, so let's get to sleepers. Uh, we talked a little bit about sleepers on the Cowboys, but let's go on a giant uh, kind of sleeper run here. Uh, first one I want to talk about is Dante Pettis. Because Dante Pettis, uh, I don't know if you know this, we, I went to, uh, when I was younger, I went to a Catholic school. And we had a little football league, uh, and we used to play the school called St. Edwards. And St. Edwards uh, had a wide receiver named Dante Pettis. <laughs> so... I actually played flag football with Dante uh, multiple times over two, three years. Really? And he was always their best player. Didn't think, I'm not going to shade at him, but I didn't think he'd end up making the NFL. 
Let's just say that. We had a lot of talented guys in our team. Not necessarily a lot of football players. We had a lot of talented players. Uh, but it's it's pretty cool to see a guy that really is local. He went to J. Sarah High School, which is literally five minutes down the road from here uh, at the OC Rock Radio Studios. Um, so good for him. He's the first J. Sarah player ever to go to the NFL. That's super insider news. Uh, but nonetheless... Good for him, and I think he's a steal. I think the 49ers picked him up. Oh, he's a steal. Oh, he's a steal. We, we were talking about this during One break. of the best returners uh, in college football, probably going to be one of the best returners. Leads in, college football with in, most return touchdowns. Yeah, it is ridiculous. I mean, last year, every single time he was w- with Washington, he got the ball on a punt return, a kick return, it was like, this could li- literally be a touchdown every single time. He found a way to do it. Uh, he's a steal. He's not just a receiver. He's a special teams guy, which is important. Uh, I think the Niners have a lot of these dudes on their team where they got a lot of these hybrid kind of players, and I think it's going to be good. The Niners are going to be pretty good next year. Not ready to say they're going to be a playoff team, but they are starting to stack up more players than I thought, and this Dante Pettis pick is a very good pick. Yeah, no, he is. He he's a, technically is a sleeper because he wasn't picked in the first round, but yeah. if you go back and watch his tape, and listen... Every NFL team had their eyes on Dante Pettis, not only because he's a receiver, but because how versatile he is. He does so many different things. He's the kick returner. He's a punt returner. So I think he's going to be able to contribute uh, on offense as a, as a slot receiver and even on the outside for the 49ers right away because other than Pierre Garçon, I don't really think they have another solid number two receiver. Yeah. Um, and I think you, know, you can't have enough weapons for Jimmy G. So I think he's going to be able to get some repetitions at receiver. But I think where he's going to make an immediate impact is on special teams in the punt and kick return game. Um, listen, I'm, I'm already saying it. he's going to have two or three return touchdowns this year. I'm, just, I'm throwing it out there right okay, now. That's, I that's think, interesting. I think he will be up there. I don't know if he's going to lead the league, but he will be you know top two or top three uh, in return and kickoff touchdowns. I think he's that dynamic and that special. Uh, and listen, even if he doesn't pan out necessarily as a as a receiver throughout his career, I think he's going to be able to make his name and make money in the return game, almost like a Devin Hester type, to yeah, where totally. you know maybe uh, he doesn't pan out fully as a receiver, but um, pick punt return, kick return, he he's going to do really really well for the 49ers, and I'm excited to see how they actually. Use yeah, I know it. why the NFC West has to become so good this year. <laughs> you know, the Cardinals are getting better, and it just seems like every team in the NFC West is just blah blah blah. You know, just 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 going upwards. So. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a good pick. I know you had a lot more players you want to talk about as far as sleepers, so why don't you... Throw, yeah, throw another sleeper, uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I think they hit on a running back, Ronald Jones the See, second. This is one of the guys I said was yeah, a sleeper, Yeah, too. he yeah. is uh, a guy from SC, so so right at the right at the freeway here. Um, local local player. Another local guy. Yeah, um, I think two things. One, not only is Ronald Jones a home run hitter, he's like a Chris Johnson type. He can run between the tackles, but if he gets open... Um, he he's scoring. He's scoring. Well, you know? plus, I mean, he was yeah. a track guy as well. His speed is ridiculous. He ran like a sub four four. Um, so he he's he's lightning quick. But one of the biggest reasons why I think he's going to have an impact is because they really only have Jaquiz Rogers they, they still and and one other run other sure. running back on their depth chart. So I think he's going to have a chance to start for him. And if you can give Jameis Winston a, a, a solid running back, so Jameis Winston can you know have a little pressure taken off of his shoulders. I think the San Bay Buccaneers offense with Mike Evans um, uh, and with Deshaun Jackson uh, and with uh, who's their tight end that they drafted last year? Uh, I know who. Oh, OJ, oh, Howard. OJ, yeah, Howard. OJ Howard. OJ Howard. Thank you. I think this offense now becomes pretty dynamic. Yeah, no, it's pretty solid. Uh, I don't necessarily know whether, how their line is, uh, but Ronald Jones, good pick. They got him. Was it was it late second round? Uh, early second round. Early with, second with their, round. Okay. With their the, yeah, the sixth pick in the second round. Okay. Yeah. So it's so a pretty early pick, but. Um, Nonetheless, Ronald Jones, uh, the second, is a, is a great player. I had him as a sleeper before the draft. Uh, getting drafted, let's say, necessarily early second round is almost like being a first-round pick. So I don't think that we can call him 100% a sleeper. We kind of just want to give credit to the, for, the, uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Hey, but if you're a fantasy owner, you might want to pick up Ronald Jones the I'm, second. I'm drafting him. Yeah, because he's going to be a good player uh, next year. And... Uh, I think it will be uh, he, he, it'll be good for the Buccaneers. I don't know how they'll do. They're such a random team, and uh, I I don't know what to think about Jameis Winston necessarily yet. I just don't know if he's going to be that star quarterback that he was in college. I think you look at the two quarterbacks that kind of came out of that era. I think Mariota looks like the one that's probably going to be a little better, but he has also has had a running back. And this Doug Martin trial they've had the last couple of years has not work did not work. 
Uh, so I think it was it was essential they drafted the running back. They got their guy in the first round. I don't remember who they drafted in the first round, but they got a guy in the first round, and then they get their running back, who they really needed in the second round. Ronald Jones, the the second, could have been a first round pick in my right. opinion. Right, good, too. good. So, uh, a good pick for that. Now, here's two other things I want to I want to mention. So Sonny Michelle, Nick Chubb, uh, the Georgia quarterback or the Georgia running backs. Michelle goes to New England, which I think is super underrated, and Chubb goes to Cleveland. We were talking about oh maybe they should draft Saquon Barkley, stuff like that. I think Chubb's pretty good running back too. What were your thoughts on those two picks? Yeah, no, I think they're they're great landing spots for both players. Starting with Chubb, two years ago before he he tore his knee up, yeah. he was considered to be the top running back coming out in the draft. Um, obviously now Saquon Barkley was that guy, but Chubb, uh, talent wise, is is by far one of the best running backs in the draft, and I, I'm hoping that his knee has completely healed now. I know last year he was still wearing that knee brace, so I'm not sure if that was just precautionary or because he wasn't exactly 100%. But I think the Browns get a, a steal with him. And the great thing is they don't immediately have to use him. They, he doesn't have to be the because bell cow because yeah. they have Carlos Hyde. So mm-hmm. Chubb can come in, you know, get a, probably five to 10 reps a game and ease his way into the NFL. And I think that's going to be great for him. I think in a year or two, Chubb can can turn into their number one running back, and I think that's a really, really good situation for him. Uh, Sonny Michel, he goes to New England, and obviously we know with New England, they use multiple running backs in their system. So another instance where Michel doesn't have to be the lead guy, right? So there's not as much pressure on him. I think he can come in in multiple situations. He can come in on first and second down and be that bell cow guy, but he can also be your third down running back. He's great in, in pass block protection, and he can also catch the ball out of the backfield. So I think he's more of an all-around running back, and I think uh, Josh McDaniels, the the Patriots offensive coordinator, is gonna is gonna have a lot of fun uh, trying to figure out ways to get the ball in his hands. I know Tom Brady's gonna love him. They they like to do little screens and kind of dumps into the flat with their running backs. So Sony Michelle is going to be another guy that uh, is is somewhat of a sleeper. But uh, you know, if you're a fan in fantasy, I would draft him, yeah. and uh, I think that definitely helps the Patriots. They they got Jeremy Hill. Uh, who they they picked up in free agency from the That's Bengals, right. Sonny Michelle. Um, they they you know they've they've gotten some really really good running backs in, in the last couple of years, even though they have lost some guys too. Yeah. So and I want to throw out one more. Uh, I'll talk about this one. Um, the Cardinals second pick, second round pick, Christian Kirk, another guy that can return. Uh, that that can that, that would be a kick returner, and the Cardinals have desperately needed a kick returner the last couple of years. Guys like. Crow Williams have not got the job done. David Johnson at one point was returning kicks for us, I think, two years ago. That is not going to happen. How come Patrick Peterson doesn't do it anymore? It's just because he's too he valuable still returns on defense. Punts. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I see. It's another one where it's like he's the best one, but it's just do we risk him getting injured on a punt return? That's how Tyron Matthew tore his had his first ACL tear uh. was on a punt return. So I get a little sketchy with that. Uh, but I think Christian Kirk is kind of that return guy now, and he'll be that guy coming in. But another local guy, guy he actually went to my mom's high school in uh, in Arizona. Wow. So another local little connection with the Cardinals pick. Um, and uh, and I just think he's, he's going to be a nice receiver to compliment. He could be that next Michael Floyd, which is the Cardinals they've been looking at looking for essentially since they were had that Super Bowl run. Because obviously we had the Michael Floyd, the DUI, and all that stuff happen, and we really haven't had that second receiver next to Larry Fitzgerald and with the offense changing I think it was a solid pick and just another possible sleeper pick later in the second round than most of the other guys but I know you wanted to mention one more running back uh, I believe it's the North North uh, Carolina State running it is back. yeah Naheem Hines you go. now this guy is 5'8 198 pounds oh. so you see him Step walking back. Down, you see him walking down the street and he looks like an average dude little do you know he's really a Darren Sproles of the Ooh. NFL uh, he he kind of does it all. You don't you wouldn't really expect a five eight running back to be able to you know be a bruiser and run between the tackles. He can do that. He's obviously more known for running outside, mm-hmm. catching the ball out of the backfield. Uh, he also can return in the punt and kick returning game. Um, I think this is a steal for the Colts because I'm not saying he's going to be their lead back who gets the ball 25, 30 times a game, but I think Andrew Luck really hasn't had a versatile running back throughout his career. Obviously, Frank Gore has been his lead back for the last couple of years, and Frank Gore can still get it done, but he's not as good of a catcher out of the backfield, and he doesn't do multiple things that I think can help Andrew Luck. Uh, we already mentioned with their first pick, they, they got uh, Quentin Nelson, the people already saying he's a Hall of Fame guard. Solid pick. So, you know, another guy that needs to, can help keep Andrew Luck upright. But Andrew Luck needs weapons, and everyone knows that T.Y. Hilton is basically the only weapon on the team so T.Y. Hilton gets double teamed all day long. 
So I think Naheem Hines is going to get an opportunity to come in, be singled up with a linebacker more than likely. And if you put a linebacker on Hines, uh, it's going to be a win for him all day long. So I think this was a really, really good pick for the Colts. I think this helps Andrew Luck, and hopefully he can get on the field because um, you know we haven't seen him the last year, almost two years. And uh, if, if Andrew Luck doesn't get on the field this year, I think they're going to have to think about turning the page with him. Oh, in God, would that suck for the Colts. Yes, yeah, it, it would, after would all they've invested in him. But uh, just going back to Hines, a really good player. They got him in the fourth round. I think that was a big steal. I thought he could have gone in the second round, even the third. But the fact that they he lasted until the fourth round, I think that's one of the bigger steals of the draft. Now, you're saying the Colts haven't had a running back since Frank Gore. Uh, you don't think Trent Richardson was a good running back? Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We all know this. I don't even think terrible. I need to answer that question. He sucked. He played for the Browns and still sucked for the Browns. So... Uh, no, 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 that was, that was intended for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to say one player, and I can't remember his name now. I don't know what I was going to say, and we still got a couple minutes left in the segment. Oh, boy. So, uh, oh, yeah. Okay, no, no, no. I wanted to say, so we got about two minutes left. Um, Darius Geis, why do you think he dropped so there were There were a lot of reports on, the, uh, on Thursday, the, the first round of the draft, that Darius Geis had a... Not necessarily off the field issues as far as uh, you know things. Good old with, off the field issues, right? But it was more of his attitude, his personality, and uh, another one of those situations, almost like I was talking about with Josh Rosen earlier, that teams were skeptical of uh, how much love he had for the game of football, hmm. um, how much he was willing to actually dedicate to the game. And, you know, when we start to throw millions of dollars at this kid, is he still going to have that enthusiasm and that passion and that work ethic to come in every single day, work hard, and be the best back he can be? Or is he going to kind of slide off a little bit and, ex you know, just think that his talent is going to get him by? So hmm. those are the reports that were being uh, put out there. I, who knows if that was true? Yeah. Obviously, he came out and denied those and said... You know, he, he thinks that he's the best running back in the draft. He's obviously really, really good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, who knows if that's true or not. But, I mean, he did fall in the draft. So there are obviously multiple teams, a lot of teams, um, that, that obviously knew something that maybe we don't. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting you bring that up. I did not know that about him. Uh, I remember he was the guy that was saying, wasn't he that was saying that they were asking him um, was it whether he was gay or not? They or did. Something? Yeah, they yeah, did. So, you know, I don't know, maybe uh, possibly could have made that up if they're saying that he uh, he was, uh, he was had a little off-the-field issues. Not saying, I'm not accusing him of doing that, but just saying, you never know. All right, well, that's we actually want to talk about NBA in this segment, but we still talk about the draft. So that that's the, that's the way I like it, though. We want to talk about all this stuff, and, and we got it all in. Coming up next is Do You Care? A little later in the show, uh, NBA talk, full playoff, we'll have a full playoff. Uh, section a little bit later, but on the way is do you care? Do you feel appreciated by them and do they have the appropriate gratitude for what you have achieved? I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I man, that is a tough question. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they, well, they your wife, your wife seems to indicate. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody in general wants to be appreciated more at work you know, in their professional life. But there's a lot of people that are appreciate me more than, you know, way more than I ever thought, you know, was possible as part of my life. Aston, oh, Aston Reese was run hard, and he is shaken up. And it was Wilson. Meanwhile, this is thrown out in front, and a backhander is stopped by Murray, and play is halted. Uh, there's blood by the gloves. Zach Aston Reese was over stick handling. Wilson came in at a high rate of speed, and he lets Zach Aston Reese have it. So a guy like Corey Seager, the Dodgers, I think what they do is they see where they're at come trade deadline. I don't think you go out and make a move. You have to see. They haven't played well with Corey Seager right. up this first month. And this first month, their schedule was not all that demanding. In fact, going into tonight's ball game, the only team that they played that had over a 500 record were these Arizona Diamondbacks. So they've got to get their own house in order. Once they do that, then they can explore options. But Chris Taylor is the option right now. Come to podcast back here on OC Rock Radio. Once again, I'm Nick Nina. I'm Jared Smith. 
And uh, Jared, do you know what time it is right now? What time is it, Nick? It's time for Do You Care? Care, care, care. You know, I said <laughs> I was going to do a better one than last week. Huh. Because my la- la- you, 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 you kind of talk crap on my one last week. So I had to do a little bit better, put a little more emphasis on it, and start Do You Care the right way. Right, Jared? Right, right. <laughs> right. Hey, whatever, whatever you yeah. feel like. They, yeah, sorry. It's, 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 I gotta get it's my, your time. I gotta get my fix. I let you roll with it. No, I gotta get my fix. You know? All right. Uh, uh, all right, Jared, we'll start, uh, we'll start with you uh, getting the first question. Do you care that Kendrick Perkins and rapper Drake got exchanged words after the Raptors Cavs game? No, I don't care. And as Dang, far I as really I know, don't care about this one. I don't think anyone else, unless you were actually there and you could hear them, knows what happened. There was a video, like a 30 second video that came out. Um, and, you know, you can hear Perkins kind of talking as he's walking into the tunnel. And then you see Drake and some of his other guys around him, along with uh, the Raptors security, kind of holding Drake back a little bit so that Perkins can go into the tunnel. Um, and you hear Drake saying, you know, I didn't do that, I didn't say that, but you don't know what was said. So to be honest, I think it's much of nothing. Perkins wasn't even playing in the game. Oh, he was, is the coach? He, he was in a suit. Or is he, no, he's no. actually still playing? He's still playing. But he's like, <laughs> I, he's, totally, I didn't even think he was playing. He, I don't know if he's injured or if he's just not suiting up <laughs> oh uh, for game days, but like, yeah, he was literally, he's in a suit, he's not even playing. So I don't know what was said. And the thing is like, the Cavs won the game. So what does Perkins have to be pissed about? Like, unless Drake came up and said something to Perkins. But, I mean, realistically, like, I think we've spent enough time on this. I don't even know why we're still talking about it. No, I don't care. I think it's stupid. Um, this is probably the most uh, media coverage that Perkins has gotten in a long, long time. And probably the last that he's going to get until his retirement. On. Yeah, I'm just laying it on. I'm not, I'm not a big Perkins fan, as you can tell. disrespect. I didn't even think he was still playing. No, he is. Wow. He is. Oh yeah, my yeah. Gosh. yeah, he's That's still playing. Crazy. So um, who knows what was actually said. But no, I do not care uh nick do you care and i have a pretty good feeling of your answer Uh-oh. on this one uh cory seager is out for the season no that's what i said on twitter after i heard this uh, uh the uh yes i do care about this um man does it suck because the dodgers had already a not very good start to the season subpar as a lot of people would say they have a losing record and they continue to lose like every other game but um yeah, Seager is, Seager is probably the, the one player on the Dodgers that was kind of a sure thing. Even even though he was he didn't have the best start to the year, he was always that nice cog at shortstop, great defensively, and in, he's always that middle of the order lineup, two, three, four, you put him really at wherever. So to have him lost uh, really does hurt the lineup. Now, Chris Taylor, who of course came out last year and, and, and kind of surprised everybody, He's been playing left field and center field uh, these past this, this past year and a half. Uh, he's going to move back to his original position at shortstop. So the Dodgers are still going to have a solid shortstop now as far as defensively goes. Uh, and Taylor's a pretty good hitter as well. The Dodgers got enough depth to fill in for Seager, but you can't really truly fill in for Corey Seager. So the Dodgers are definitely going to miss him out. Now this has also sparked rumors that they might possibly go after Manny Machado. Uh, because Machado is a free agent after this season, so you'd be kind of t- picking him up as a rental. I want to say, as a true Dodger fan, I don't lo- I don't necessarily want to do that because I get that he, you know you get his contract for half a season. It doesn't really matter how much money his contract is worth right now. It's not really worth much. But you'd have to give up one of your top prospects, and I think for a guy that you're absolutely not going to sign the next year because your third baseman is Justin Turner and your shortstop is Corey Seager when they eventually both come back. I do think that Machado would be kind of a waste of prospects or whatever we trade for him. So I don't think that's a good idea, but it has sparked rumors. And Machado has come out and said that he doesn't really want to play anywhere else besides Baltimore. That's probably not true because Baltimore is one of the worst teams in the league right now. Uh, But let's pump the brakes on the Manny Machado stuff. I know... That the Dodgers have recently, last I'm going to go throw back last 10 years, made some very interesting acquisitions in Manny Ramirez, in Adrian Gonzalez, in Hanley Ramirez, and um, and and of course uh, some other guys at the, uh, at the at the the trade deadline. I just don't think you go out and get Manny Machado because there's no way you're going to sign him next year. I think that's just a waste of whoever you trade uh, because I think they have enough depth. Uh, to kind of fill in enough for Corey Seager. I, but I don't know about this team as far as a World Series contender anymore. This, the, this is combined with this start, combined with the injury to Justin Turner, and now with Corey Seager absolutely not playing. 
I think this is a this is a tough one for the Dodgers. Uh, Jared, do you care that Tom Wilson broke someone's jaw last night in the Penns Capitals game? Uh I don't care, but I think it's a very interesting situation. And like you were telling me uh, off the air before we just came back on, this isn't Tom Wilson's first incident no, uh, not. as far as having a, a major collision with another player. Uh, obviously, I don't follow um, hockey as much as you do, so you kind of give me a little insight. But I went back and did a little bit of research, and uh, it turns out that in game two, he also had, a, had another really high hit. Uh, I think Brian Demolian. Oh, he, had to, he, had, uh, he hasn't played since. Right, yeah, and yeah. it knocked him out of the game in game two as well. And then um, in last night's game, um, he took out um, Austin, Aston, Aston Reese. Reese yeah, yeah, Aston Reese, and also knocked him out of the game. And the interesting thing was, Wilson wasn't uh, penalized for either of those hits, it's or at ridiculous. least he hasn't been penalized for either of those hits yet. And he was actually pretty instrumental in that uh, game winning goal by Ovechkin. Um, so, really, really interesting. Listen, I will say this. Um, I know the league is going to go back and they're going to review the hit to see that if it was legal, to see if he led with his shoulder and he wasn't aiming for uh, the other player's head. But if he doesn't get suspended and he does play, I think you can bet the house that these Pittsburgh Penguins are going to come after Wilson next year. Oh, I absolutely hope Yeah, so if you're Wilson, you better brace up put some extra padding on, uh, and get some extra rest because you're about to be in for a brutal night. I can guarantee you that um, if any one of my opponents or, or teammates or anything like that got hit like Wilson has hit two of my guys and he continued to play, you can guarantee that he's going to get a couple, uh, a couple love taps, let's call it that, uh, in the next game. So very interesting to see how that comes into to play. Nick, uh, sticking with hockey, do you care? that uh, the Stanley Cup playoffs are now on to the second round. Uh, of course. And the, the, all this stuff you just talked about with Tom Wilson happened in the second round. The series are really good. I don't think I've ever seen a second round where legitimately I believe every single team could end up making it to the Stanley Cup final. Like, these series are great. You have Winnipeg and Nashville, who have been two of the best teams in the NHL the whole season, absolutely duking it out. You have Boston and Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay being the team that was dominant all season compared to Boston, who was dominant at the end of the season. You have uh, the Sharks and, and Golden Knights, who absolutely embarrassed our two Southern California teams. They're really good, too. And, of course, Capitals, Penguins. That's a good old rivalry with Ovechkin and Sidney Crosby. This series are great, and I'm excited to see. So I do care about this, of course. Uh, but I'm excited to see these games. Every single game has been pretty good. Uh, none of the series are 2-0 or anything like that. They're all going to go to at least a Game 5, possibly a Game 6. And uh, I just think this is very good for the NHL that there's a lot of parity, but the parity is, is, is with a lot of dominant teams. And you're seeing a lot of good hockey. And if you're a hockey fan, you got to keep watching these the, these series. And because I, I, I mentioned that the, the teams are so good, the next round's going to be just as good, and the Stanley Cup Final will probably be, be epic. So... Uh, it's good for the NHL, and I'm glad the second round is rolling along so nicely. Jared, do you care that Eric Reed has filed a grievance against the NFL? I do care. Um, this situation goes beyond football. Uh, I really think Eric Reed, who uh, was a first-round pick by the 49ers out of LSU four years ago, and his contract just ended with the 49ers, they did not pick up his fifth-year option. Um, and, and they can sit here and say that it was all because of his performance on the field. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. Eric Reed was one of the main players who uh, was associated with kneeling along with Colin Kaepernick and been one of his biggest, one of uh, Colin Kaepernick's biggest supporters so far throughout this entire process. So uh, in my opinion, and I know I'm not the only one that thinks this way, um, I, I feel that a lot of owners have chosen not to sign Eric Reed because of the, the backlash and because of everything else that is going on off of the field. I think on the field, he's a damn good safety. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to sit here and say he's like a top 10 safety, but I think he's a starting safety in the NFL. And I think he definitely, you know, he's only, he's going into his fifth season. So he's in the prime of his career right now. And uh, yeah, no, I, the, the type of talent that he has, that he should not be, uh, you know, a, a free agent at this point. Uh, after the draft, with, with free agency that's already gone through in March. Um, he should be on an NFL team right now. And like I said, I think owners are scared because of the backlash from fans and from Roger Goodell and from uh, everything else that would come along with signing Eric Reed. So um, who knows if he, you know, hopefully he does get another opportunity. 
Um, I was reading an article a couple weeks ago that said that Eric Reed um, is still unsure of whether he will kneel or stand up during the national anthem. So um, I think, you know, eventually he will get on a team, but I think he's going to have to come forward and sit down with, with teams and ownership and, uh, you know, explain his situation. And they're going to they're gonna have to come to some type of compromise. Mm -hmm. um, either he's going to have to agree to stand up or he's going to have to say something that wins over the ownership. Because right now, I don't think there are many teams that want to get involved with this and uh, have all the immediate attention that comes along with it. So uh, to me, this is, like I said, all about uh, off the field issues, nothing to do with his talent, because I believe that he's a starting uh, safety in this league and he should be on the field because of his, uh, his, his talent on the field. Uh, Nick, last question, sticking with the NFL. Do you care that Tom Brady... Uh, had some interesting comments this weekend that I'm going to let you elaborate on. Yes, I do. These interesting comments uh, included, uh, I plead the fifth, uh, and, and, and just other comments about him not um, necessarily thinking that he's appreciated enough with the New England Patriots. Now, he did go along to say that he doesn't believe that anybody that's kind of in his situation, anybody that's a star is appreciated enough. Um, I forget if this was actually Tom Brady that said this or just some commentator mentioning this. Um, but they said that if you look at a lot of guys that make a lot of money, like these billionaires or these superstar athletes, the Peyton Manning and stuff, they were never really fully comfortable in their situation. So for Tom Brady to say that he's not comfortable with the Patriots or he doesn't believe he's appreciated enough, it kind of does make sense. But I think with all this happening, because Tom usually in the past couple of years – has just deflected these kind of dumb comments and has deflected and said, you know, whatever, or just, you know, he, you know, he said nothing. And he did say the plea, the fifth thing. But it does seem now that there is a, there are some issues with the Patriots after all. And I know I was one of these people that was saying, no, there's no, you know, there's no stuff. They ended up making the Super Bowl, all this stuff. But I'm starting to think now that Tom Brady and the Patriots are not seeing eye to eye. And whether it's McDaniels, or whether it's Bill Belichick, or Robert Kraft, or someone else on the team, I, it does seem like now, it, this dynasty with the Patriots, even though they made the Super Bowl last two years, and even though they made the Super Bowl last year, this dynasty with the Patriots might finally be coming to an end. Hey, and look, there's a new guy in the NFC East, uh, not Josh Allen, but Sam Darnold, that could possibly take over this division once the Patriots uh, are finished with this whole Tom Brady, Bill Belichick era. Uh, so we kind of see the guy coming up. Now, we've never seen Sam Darnold play, but nonetheless, uh, I think there's starting to be a little bit of a changing of the guard in the, uh, I keep seeing NFC East, my bad. I mean the AFC East. Uh, there's a little bit of changing of the guard, and I do think there, there are some issues with the Patriots. Now. It should be interesting to see the rest of the season, how this goes, and how long Tom Brady plays. I think we said last week on the podcast, we both believe he's about two years away from being retired, and that's a, that's a, a solid take. And I think that's even more uh, apparent now after this interview. Uh, so, yeah, Patriots, uh, Patriots finally is finally going to be over. Uh, or will it? I don't know. They'll probably, <laughs> they'll probably pick up some quarterback or draft some quarterback. They'll be next Tom Brady. I mean, they draft Tom Brady in the sixth round, for God's sake. <laughs> like, there, there's, uh, there's some craziness there. All right. It's the end of, of Do You Care? We're going to finally get to the NBA playoffs, uh, like we said, coming up next. So we'll be talking Cavaliers. We'll be talking Steph Curry returning uh, and anything else we want to talk about. The Rockets dominance, whatever. Uh, but so NBA playoffs on the other side of this quick break. What are the three things we know about Oklahoma City? It's not a free agent destination. There is now a... There's now a real stigma of playing with Westbrook, and Paul George can go anywhere he wants now. So don't you think, like that guy who goes to Vegas who's going to propose, because once Paul George leaves, Mello shot, nobody now is going to want to play with you. Ovation for the return of the two-time MVP. Drives in, DeRozan, ball fake, kick out, Van Vliet, three seconds, Van Vliet, no good! Cleveland's got the rebound, and it's over! 
Cover 2 podcast on OC Rock Radio for our final segment, dig, diving into the NBA playoffs. We are down to the last four playoff matchups, yes. and we want to get started with the Cavaliers and the Raptors. Came down, uh, game actually went into overtime last night. Ooh, I know yeah. we talked in Do You Care about the whole Perkins-Drake talk, but let's actually get into the actual matchup. Cavs uh, beat the Raptors by one. Um, LeBron James came out after the game and said that he had a one of his uh, most horrible playoff performances of his career. But nonetheless, in the end, the Cavaliers won, which is all that matters to him. Uh, so, Nick, I want to get your thoughts on uh, not only this game, uh, but this series and how you think it's going to play out. Yeah, great game, first of all, last night. Uh, both games. We're talking, we say last night, Tuesday. Um, it was game two for Warriors, Pelicans, game one for Toronto and the Cavs. Uh, but, yeah, great game, back and forth. At one point, the Raptors had a big lead. Uh, they blew it, of course. <laughs> and uh, and the Cavs come back and win the great overtime thriller. Uh, you know what's funny? I knew this was going to happen, too, because the Cavs barely escape Indiana. Literally barely escape getting past the Pacers. And then what do they do? Uh, after LeBron literally put them on his back uh, against Indiana, they go and they prove somehow out of the blue that they actually don't need LeBron to win a game and that LeBron can have somewhat of a bad game and the Cavs will still win. Uh, but what's interesting about the series is I don't think this game really is a show of what's going to happen in the series. I think it was a good game. It's back and forth. It shows that both teams are good. Because, of course, the Cavs are good. When you have LeBron James, you're going to be a good team. Uh, but I do actually think that Toronto is still going to win the series. I think it's going to take six or seven. I don't think they're going to rattle off four in a row. But uh, I do think Toronto has the better players. They have a better bench. And I think they will eventually um, win this series. Now, I absolutely do think that they do need to win game two. I think game two is a must win for Toronto. Uh, I think you go 1-1 one, one into Cleveland and you have uh, a better chance of you know, getting out of there without being down 3-1, of course. Uh, or potentially losing the series. But I do think Toronto will eventually win this series. I don't think the Cavs have enough. We saw in the Indiana series how much. I mean, LeBron had to almost score 50 points a game. Uh, and I think they got lucky in this game that Toronto didn't shoot the ball that well. Uh, but I think Toronto will come out better. Hopefully Toronto's demons aren't still with them. That's kind of a hard thing to predict. But I do think they have the better team. So I'm going to say they're going to win the series in 6 or 7. I would... I. I'm hoping that Toronto wins the series uh, because I'm I, just me. Frankly, I'm tired of seeing the Cavaliers absolutely get to the you know the finals. Um, and and I do agree. I think Toronto is very very talented. Um, and I think and this is kind of jumping ahead a little bit. If Toronto doesn't get past this round, um, I think there's going to have to be some changes in the lineup as far as uh, Demar Derozan and Kyle Lowry being together. Those are the the two stars for this team. But they've been together for a couple of years now, and they haven't really been able to get over that hump. So I think some things might have to change if they don't win. Um, but listen, they took the Cavaliers into overtime and only lost by one point. Yeah. So um, I think the, the Raptors will win this game, but I think it's going to take seven. I think, fortunately for the Raptors, they do have that home court advantage, which they kind of lost last night because of, they did uh, lose to Cleveland. But I think they can still get it back. I think they can easily go into Cleveland and steal a game on the road. Um, and get themselves back to back to even. Uh, but listen, really, I don't think this game last night was about LeBron James. To me, I think it was about Kyle Korver and J.R. Smith. They combined for 10 made three-pointers. Um, uh, Korver had 19 points, J.R. Smith had 20. I think that was one of the big factors in this game. Obviously, both of those guys are known for their three-point shooting abilities. And when they're on like that, it takes a lot of pressure off LeBron to where we know LeBron's not you know the greatest shooter, pure shooter, but uh, he's great when he doesn't have to do everything himself. Like in games where LeBron has to take over, we know that he can do it, but they, they've surrounded LeBron with this supporting cast of Love and Corver and Smith and all these other guys, Clarkson and Larry Nance Jr. Um, and for a reason. And it, in the playoffs, it's time for these guys to step up 
and they did step up last night. So uh, if Cleveland wants to win and continue winning, they're going to have to get other performances from their, their second-tier guys like they did last night because if they expect LeBron to come out and, and put up 40 a night and, and have to carry the team, yeah. I'm, I'm not so sure that he can do it against a talented squad like the Raptors. Now, I will say LeBron did post a triple-double. It was his 21st triple-double of his career in the playoffs, and I believe he's only second behind Magic Johnson. So that's a pretty Ooh, big that's a pretty big cool. feat right there, yeah. So I, I think that it's a great win. LeBron can kind of spread the ball around. He ob- he still ha- left the game with twenty six points, so he obviously did his thing shooting and scoring, but he was able to facilitate and get his other players involved. And I think that's how Cleveland uh, has to play if they want to win. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I think it's going to take Cleveland's best effort probably ever with this side of t- teams to beat Toronto. Um, I just think Toronto has too much talent and. If they start playing the hero ball with LeBron, although he's an all-time player, although he's top three, top two, whatever you want to say, maybe best player of all time, Michael Jordan lost series too, (laughs) okay? Kobe lost series too. So this can still happen. They barely escaped Indiana. I mean, Indiana was literally this close, and they don't even have a star on their team, really. I mean, Oladipo's good, but he's he's not a star. So Toronto's got two guys. And potentially, you know, and very solid players like Ibaka and Valanciunas and, and stuff like that. So, I think, you know, Toronto's got to come out. They got to win Game Two. I think it's a must win. They got to make it at least two two uh, when they go back to Cleveland for Game Five. And I think they have this series uh, in six or seven. I, I'm not even. I, I don't even think it has to take uh, all seven. But uh, yeah, I think the Raptors still win unless the Cavs come out with a crazy or this team, these players just start playing. But I haven't seen that yet. Uh, so let's move on to Warriors and Pelicans. This is another game that was on Tuesday night. Uh, Warriors go up 2-0. I know. I know what you guys are saying. Nick, you said the Pelicans were going to you know, maybe win this series. Well, yeah. I said if they, if they at least win a game in Golden State, they'll win this series. But they didn't do that. So I do think the Warriors will eventually win this series. But I think the bigger take and the, the, bigger, the bigger news about the story is the return of Mr. Two-time MVP Stephen Curry. Oh, yeah. Back to the lineup. And, man, did he put on a show last night. 28 points, uh, a couple of those vintage long three-pointers. Oh, yeah. Got a lot of steals. That's why I noticed at least from that game. I watched a lot of this game last night. And, uh, you know, they're just, the Warriors are just better, better than the Pelicans, okay? The Pelicans still are showing some fight. Uh, they showed some fight all the way to the end of the game, only losing by five. I mean, they, they literally just kept putting the, 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 um, their foot on the gas at the end of that game. Uh, very physical. Lots of interesting stuff happened. Uh, a terrible flagrant call in that game. We're not going to get into that. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I think the Pelicans could still steal one or possibly two games in this series. Because they are a very good team. I really wish they had DeMarcus Cousins now because I think this series would be different. I think it would be um, 1-1 if they had DeMarcus Cousins. But nonetheless, they don't. Uh, and we have playoff Rondo and Anthony Davis. But and nonetheless, it, it looks like the war here is... With Steph Curry, I mean, he looks like he's healthy. Hopefully he doesn't get injured again. But the Warriors are going to make a run for the finals after all, and it's going to be legitimate. And I really hope we get a Rockets-Warriors series. Oh, yeah. Because, and we probably are. Oh, but, man, is that going to be a barn burner. One of the best series we're going to see in the last couple years. Yeah, no, it is. Listen, the Pelicans, in my opinion, played the, the best game of this series so far. In Game 1, um, I don't think they really had any type of control. No, I'm just going to give you some yeah. quick stats. And for, for game two, that was last night. New Orleans, by quarter, had 29 points in the first, scored 26 uh, in the second. In the third quarter, they scored 31. In the fourth quarter, they scored 30. They put up 116 points. You would think that should be a victory yeah, against almost the any other team. Not against the Warriors. Um, some, of their, some of their guys, Anthony Davis put up 25. Rajon Rondo put up 22 points. Drew Holiday had 24. Um, Miritich had 18 and more. Uh, their, their small forward had 14 points. So all of their starters were in double figures. Where they were hurt was their bench. Their bench combined for 15 points. And that's just not good enough against this Warriors team. Now, I, I think their starters can, will be able to keep them in this series, and I agree. I think they're going to be able to get one game at home. I think that's all they're going to get. I think it's going to go back to Golden State for Game 5, and I think the Warriors are going to be able to close it out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Pelicans are going to have to get more from their bench uh, because, yeah, with Steph Curry coming back, and let's mention, Steph Curry came off the bench as well. Steve Curry decided to not start him in this game um, for, you know, whatever reasons, whether it was a minutes restriction or whatever. 
And Steph Curry still came out, hit five out of ten uh, from from three point range. Like you said, a couple of those kind of vintage long range, just pull up, you know, thirty foot yeah. threes that he just swishes like it's no one's business. Uh, and he put up twenty eight points. So if, when this team is clicking on all cylinders, the Warriors, and they have uh, you know all their guys healthy, they're they're pretty close to unbeatable. And, and I agree. I want to see that Houston Warriors matchup. And uh, unless the Pelicans bench comes to play and contributes a little more on the offensive side of the ball. I don't see the Pelicans having any chance uh, at making this this uh, this series. I mean, okay, if Steph Curry does anything of what he did last game, they're they're gonna sweep him, which, which kind of sucks because you're not gonna have as good of a series. But you know, he's just that good. I want to give a shout out real quick. Hey, can you bring those stats up, bro? Real quick, yeah. real quick again, actually. Draymond Green had a really good game last night. I thought. Um, I think he oh he was very close to having triple double, but a lot of he assists, was. right? He was a rebound away from a triple double. He had twenty points. Nine rebounds, he had 12 assists. That's what I'm talking about. Two that, blocks, two. a steal. Also, yeah. He, he, uh, lots of uh, lots of shouting at the Pelicans bench. Of course, he kind of tackled Anthony da- Anthony Davis during the game, too. I just thought he... I, I really noticed him during the game last night, and I thought he played really well. Not necessarily that they... Well, they kind of did need him last night. He was the only one by five. So if he doesn't play as well, doesn't get as many points, you know, Pelicans might win the game. Uh, but I just, you know, if Draymond is going off, there's no way that the, this Warriors team right. is going to lose, even to the Rockets. But, so. I mean, the, the great thing about the Warriors is that that's all Draymond needs to do. I'm not saying he needs to go out and get triple doubles, yeah. but he doesn't need to score even in double digits. What points, he needs yeah. to do, he needs to, he's a rebound guy, he's a defensive guy, and he gets other players involved. And listen, this is just the product of, of his good play. When you have Steph, Clay Thompson, and Kevin Durant on your team, three pure scorers, and you're Draymond Green, you're like, all right, listen, maybe I'm not going to get the points, but all I got to do is set my guys up. And if I, you know, if I play well, I get the rebounds, I dish the ball, um, there's a really, really good chance that we're going to be able to come out of a game with a victory. And yeah, when the, when the Warriors are playing like they did last night, um, it, they're very, very hard to stop. What's it, what's it like a final prediction real quick just to, what do you think going to happen in the series? Oh, yeah, no, I, Warriors in five. Warriors in yeah, five. Yeah, I think the Pelicans will get one game at home. Um, and then the Warriors will win the other game, and then uh, the game five will come back to Golden State. And I think the Warriors. Are I'm gonna go Warriors there. in five as well. Yeah. And it's kind of it's kind of a weird pick because they're already two games in. But still, we, we, what we're saying is we think the Pelicans will win a game. So, you know, good good job, New Orleans. You're really <laughs> but uh, all right, let's move on to another pretty really good series: uh, 76ers and Celtics. This is kind of a battle of like uh, up and coming teams in a way. And unfortunately, Kyrie Irving's not playing. Of course, Gordon Hayward's not playing with a broken leg earlier in the season. Uh, Celtics take game one. This game was on Monday. Uh, and it just, I think it just shows, because you were telling me Jalen Brown didn't play in that game. No, he's got a, a strained hamstring yeah. that happened um, at the end of the game one series. Or, I'm sorry, of the first round series. Yeah. So, Jalen Brown's not playing. Gordon Hayward, Kyrie Irving. You'd think, oh, Celtics all or 76ers all the way, right? No. Celtics win. Terry Rozier has all of a sudden turned into a great player. Um, I mean, coming out of nowhere. Literally coming out. Well, I mean, he's just a, he's a backup. You yeah. know, he's a backup. He wasn't even that good in college to be. I mean, he was a great player, but he wasn't like one of the top guys that was picked up. Uh, I think with this, I want to talk about this before we kind of jump back into the series. Brad Stevens is a phenomenal coach. I mean, he just brings the best out in the players. I heard someone say this the other day. Terry Rozier, like, he brings... B to B plus players into A minus A players, right? Like like he's bringing the he's brings everybody up a full letter grade almost the way they play. I just think they signed into that giant contract. We're talking about Brad Stevens to that giant contract. Everyone was like, "What really? They're gonna give him like six years?" Well, the guy they should sign him another six years. This guy's gonna be one of the best coaches of all time, to be honest. I think he's like a great Popovich in the sense that he gets it, the best out of. Out of well, decent yeah. players. I want to ask you this: Do you think he's the best coach in the NBA right now? Right now, no. I, I still think that goes to I, I would put Popovich ahead okay. of him. Um, you know, even Kerr? though the Spurs are not in the playoffs right now, Steve Kerr, as an actual just coach, like all different levels. Um, no, I would I would actually give it to Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens. I think he's actually a better coach. He's been a, a technically he's been a coach. Uh, longer than Steve Kerr has. Steve point. Kerr obviously played in the NBA, and then he was a GM for the Suns. So being in the actual coaching position, I don't think he has as much experience. Not to say that he can't be as good, but I would give that edge to Brad Stevens when you're mm-hmm. comparing those two. But I still think Greg Popovich is the, the master and the best still head coach in the NBA. Yeah, and, and we're not throwing any shade to Stevens or not Popovich by saying this. It's just the Celtics really shouldn't have won this game. 
You know, and the 76ers didn't play that well, but this 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 kind of reminds me a little bit of the Cavs Raptors series. Not because we have a definitive better team. I think Toronto is a better team than Cleveland. I don't really know who the better team is in this series. Because, oh, I do. Because okay, well, who, who do you think it is? 76ers. So you think 76ers? No doubt. Are okay. No, no. Listen, the 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 no Celtics doubt. are without wow. Gordon Hayward, <laughs> Kyrie Irving, and Jalen Brown. Yeah. Now Jason Tatum, great player, great rookie. Al Horford. Nineteen. Yeah. yeah Al Horford, <laughs> uh, a really really good center. But when you're telling me that you have Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid. Um, Covington, J.J. Redick, um, Sarek, you, you're telling me that lineup right there, just that starting five for the 76ers, to me right now, with all the injuries the Celtics have, there's, they should not have lost that game it's young. in Boston. It's young just like the Celtics. I don't, see, I don't see that big of a difference in the starting lineup. I think it's all, it's all a bunch of young guys playing. Now, I do like Embiid. I do like Simmons. Uh, and I love J.J. Redick as a guy that will come off. Will, he starts. He, for he starts. He yes. starts. Yeah, he starts. So, I do like that lineup. I just don't know. I think they're almost so new that it's like, I mean, they literally were like one of the embarrassments of the NBA last year. And now they're a 50-win team. So, I think I think I said this. They do have an easier route to the Eastern Conference Finals necessarily because they don't go through Cleveland and Toronto. Because I think if they were playing Cleveland and Toronto right now, they would lose. I'm not going to pick them necessarily to win a series. But... I just think they're almost too new to the playoff circle. The Celtics do still have a lot of veterans like Al Horford. Um, and, and they have a lot of other guys too. They've been kind of in the, in the playoff realm so far. So I just think the Celtics have more experience. They have the better coach. No, no knocking Brett Brown. Brett Brown wins 50 games this year. That's amazing. Probably should be coach of the year, to be honest. But um, I just think Stevens is such a good coach that there's, he makes the team better. And that's kind of why I posed the question, too. I, I just think that the Celtics, along with their their minor experience in the playoffs, but more experience than the 76ers, and the Brad Stevens element, Brown will eventually come back. Uh, Kyrie and Gordon Hayward are not. But I do believe the Celtics will win this series in the long run. I think it's going to be in seven. Yeah. Okay, okay. So really, Celtics in seven. I think this... I, I The one thing I do agree with is that I think this series will go to seven games. Okay. I'll agree with you on that. Um, and this, just like I pointed out with the Pelicans and their bench, yeah, yeah. the 76ers got 17 points from their bench. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's got, why I'm saying they're not a They got team. six from Ilya Silva, and they got 11 from Marco Bellinelli. Did you hear what Ilya Silva said about the Miami fans? No. Oh, he just said it sounded like they were in like an open gym. Really? They were like in Miami. Oh, that's, that's pretty bad. Dwayne Wade got him back to once. I forget what Dwayne Wade said on Twitter, but he threw Ilya Silva through major shade. That's pretty bad. Miami fans. That's pretty bad. But yeah, no, I mean, getting back to the series... This this 76ers bench needs to produce and come up with more points. Now listen, Joel Embiid dropped 31, J.J. Redick had 20, Ben Simmons had 18. I mean, that those are really, really good numbers for their starters, and that's something that you would expect from their starters. But to only get 17 points from your bench when you had 1, 2, 3, 4, you had 8 bench players playing in the game, and you only get 17 points that's out of 8 bad. bench players, that's, that's really, bad. really, really yeah. bad. So. That, um, you know, is, is I think one of the main reasons why the Celtic, I'm sorry, why the 76ers lost. Uh, but in the end, I think the Sixers team is more talented than the, six, than the Celtics are right now. So, um, yeah, I, I think the 76ers take game two. Okay. And I think they, uh, they kind of go back and forth from there. I think it goes seven. I understand the Sixers are obviously very new. This is the majority of their players, other than uh, J.J. Redick, I believe, um, are all rookies as far as the playoffs go. Yeah. So I, I get that standpoint. Don't They don't have that veteran experience. But listen, talent, I think, can trump that. And, and I think the Sixers team, and it's probably just because I really want to see them get to the Eastern Conference Finals yeah. and maybe even the Finals. Um, but yeah, no, I, I want to see this team beat the Celtics or at least make it a really, really good series and go to second. Now, let, okay, let me, let me get this, let me get this out of you first of all. So we're, we're obviously, we're going to disagree on this. I think Celtics are better. I think they're going to win the series. You think 76ers. Do, is this 76ers going past the Celtics have anything to do with the fact that you're a Lakers fan and that you don't like the Celtics? Uh, Why would you say that, Nick? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying there's a lot of Lakers fans. Of course fans. it is. <laughs> Are, what are you talking about? I yes, I'm a Lakers fan. I, I, I never want to see the Celtics win. Are you kidding me? 
No, why would I ever root for the Celtics? I will say this. Well, yeah, I'm not saying you're rooting for them. I'm just saying they're the better team. No, the no, they're not I'll the better team. too. The, the, if, if Kyrie Irving, Gordon Hayward, and Jalen Brown were playing well, and they were not an injured, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. then yes, they would technically be the better team, talent-wise. Right now, with those three players out, the 76ers are the better team. I don't think there's any question about that. I'm sorry. I think Brad Stevens is too good of a coach. Uh, okay, I agree with that. But listen, I'm putting my he bias aside. He doesn't this, get on the this. court and he doesn't play. He doesn't get to put the ball in the hoop. That's a good point. The players yeah. have to do that. And, and I think the, the 76ers bench needs to come out uh, and play a lot better than they did because um, the, the starters did their job. The bench did not. And I think that's the reason why they lost. I will say this. And that Boston Garden is obviously tough to play. It, very, very tough. Very tough to play. But this is a lot, like, not as urgent as Toronto, but I do think 70, 76ers need to win this game. Almost I'm not a must-win game, too. I'm not going to say, yeah, almost must-win. Not fully must-win because I think these teams are more even. Uh, than Raptors and Cavs, I think that I, I think if you let LeBron get too much of a lead in the series, it's going to be tough to beat him. Uh, there's no LeBron in this series, so I think that even if the 76ers lose, it's not completely over, but it, it's it's as close to must win as you possibly can get uh, for this game too. I think they'll leave that game this night possibly, so that should be yes. fun to watch. So uh, moving on, Rockets and Jazz. Now the Jazz get out of Oklahoma City in six, play really well. But Houston absolutely slacks them game one. I think you'll agree with me on this. We were talking about this in the break. There's not even much to talk about this series. Houston is probably going to sweep them. And Houston is showing that they are legitimately a championship contender this year. And that's why we're, that's why we're saying we're so excited about this Warriors-Rockets uh, matchup. Now, I don't know if you want to actually dive into this series, but I think we're going to do it. I wanted to get your take on Russell Westbrook and Oklahoma City's kind of just collapse, falling apart. Yeah, collapse again in the playoffs. But first round to a team in Utah that nobody saw getting no, in the second. No, not round. at all. I mean, listen, Donovan Mitchell hopefully is the rookie of the year, and he's a stud. And the only way the Jazz win a game is if he goes off for forty points, and yeah. you know, uh, um, Chris Paul and James Harden just don't have good games. That is, in my opinion, the only way that the, that the Jazz don't get swept. Um, talking about the Oklahoma City Thunder, um, because really, like we mentioned, like you just mentioned, this this series with the, the Rockets series and the is Jazz, nothing. the Rockets it's are going to win the series. Yeah, that's that's almost a given. Um, listen, I, and I think this goes back to when Oklahoma City signed uh, Paul George and Carmelo Anthony. Mm -hmm. I was a little skeptical of this. I, I remember specifically saying on this show that I think it was going to take time. It was going to take at least half the season for these guys to come together and potentially gel. It did. Because when Carmelo Anthony was on the Knicks, when Paul George was on the Pacers, and uh, obviously Russell Westbrook being with the Thunder, all three of these guys are used to being the primary ball handlers. They're used to getting the ball with five seconds left and, and you know taking the last shot. So they're they're I don't think they're used to playing uh, Robin. They're 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 Batman's, or at least they think they are, right? So coming all together, um, it, listen on paper, it sounds great. They're trying to be you know uh, second fiddle to Oklahoma, to Golden State with all those superstars over there, but in the end, I think Russell Westbrook. Um, I'm not saying that he was too selfish and and didn't want to get his other players involved, but the type of player that he is, he's not the typical. Chris Paul, Magic Johnson, John Stockton point guard to where he's going to get 15 assists a game and yeah. he's okay with not scoring. He wants to score. He is a score first point guard and he's very, very good at it. But I think sometimes that hurts his, his teammates, especially a Carmelo Anthony or a Paul George, guys that are used to getting the ball and they don't get those same opportunities. So in the, the uh, you know small occasions that Carmelo Anthony does get the ball, instead of him running the offense and, and getting the best shot, he's just jacking it up because yeah. he's like, listen, I'm getting less touches. Yeah. So the touches I do get, I'm going to go up and try to score. And I think in the end, that conflict we we saw, uh, and, and it's one of the reasons why this team fell apart against the Jazz. Listen, I, like obviously the Jazz won and they deserve all the credit in the world. Oklahoma City is the better team. And Oklahoma City should have beaten the Jazz if they were able to play more like a team, but they were not. So I'm not going to sit here and put all the blame on Westbrook or all the blame on one certain player. I think it was a collective group uh, reasoning as to why they lost. And I don't think this team is going to be uh, together like they were this year. I think Paul George is probably gone. Carmelo Anthony has already come out and said that he's not coming off the bench. 
So they're going to either need to decide that, okay, we still want you and we want you as a starter, or we're going to ship you off. I think what will happen ship is... Ship him off. I think what, no, I, I think he stays. Okay, you think I think he stays? if Paul George leaves, I think that's actually a good thing for this team because that's one less alpha dog in the locker room, one less guy that needs the ball in his hands. So I think Carmelo Anthony and Russell Westbrook can work together as a tandem as compared, as compared to having all three of those guys. So, um, and plus, Paul George and Carmelo Anthony play the same position. They're, they're shooting guards yeah. slash small forwards. So it's like they kind of do the same things. I mean, I will say Paul George is a way better defender. But on the offensive side of the ball, they're more or less the same guys, in, in my opinion. So um, I think taking one of those guys out of the equation will actually help this team. Uh, and I think there will be a, a lot more unselfish play for these guys. Yeah, you make an interesting point about um, the, the taking one guy off the team. Although I think if you're an Oklahoma City fan, you hope that it's Carmelo that leaves, and maybe you keep Paul George and Russell Westbrook. Because, right, no, I agree. I mean, two things about Carmelo. One, how could he call himself a Batman averaging 11 points a game? And number two, uh, him playing defense is essentially like putting a stop sign in the middle of the court. <laughs> okay, it's, it's just like, not gonna, it's just it's standing there. So, um, I do think this Oklahoma State team needs to figure it out. I do think it hurt them that they didn't have Andre Roberson, too. I think that guy, he's right. so good he's at a really de- good defender. So good at defense that I think it does hurt them that they didn't have him. Um, but yeah, they need to figure something out. I, I, I don't know. We can pose these questions to each other, but we still have a little bit of time on the on the podcast. Um, will Russell Westbrook ever win a championship like with Oklahoma City, or is he going to have to join up with a bunch of guys to win? I, I just think he's too selfish. I don't think he's ever going to win. Th- that's a tough question. I, it, I think it's the the talent that surrounds him by himself. I, I don't. He's not a LeBron James. Yeah. He's not a, a I don't know a Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan. One of these guys that can literally carry a team on his back for the entire season and through the playoffs. He's a stud. He's a superstar. He's a household name. Fans come and pay money to see him play. He's fantastic. I think he needs a, a supporting cast, a good supporting cast around him to get to that next level. So um, I think you know by himself. He can, you know, get to 35, 40 wins as a team and, and make the playoffs as a seventh or an eighth seed. Um, but if he wants to take that next step and and really contend for the playoffs, I think he needs to take a step back in his mm-hmm. play, realize that he needs to facilitate and get more of his, his teammates involved. Because if he wants to sit here with that mentality of I'm going to do it all by myself, mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to happen. Not with all the other superstar teams like the Warriors and the Cavs that for right now and you know, the 76ers upcoming, there's too many other good teams uh, with, with elite talent, the Houston Rockets, that I don't think Westbrook can do it by himself. Yeah, no, it's going to be tough. And I think he almost needs to turn from a triple-double player to a double-double player, a guy that's just assisting and scoring. You don't need to go after the rebounds all the time. Let a big man do that or something like that. Let Stephen Adams get those. But, yeah, it's an interesting take. I, I, we we kind of turned this series, this this discussion into a, a, a Westbrook discussion, but, but just because the Rockets-Jazz series doesn't seem like... It's going to be that legitimate. But, yeah, Oklahoma City need, needs to make some differences because it was a dumpster fire, a lot of those games with Carmelo, Paul George, and Westbrook. And I'm sure we'll discuss possibly West, or Paul George coming to L.A. sooner rather than later. All right, you hear the music right there. That means it is uh, the podcast is coming to an end. I feel like we can keep talking about this NBA stuff. We don't All like, day long. Yeah, we could. Uh, but so, playoffs look good. Uh, we gave you kind of our predictions real quick. I, I had... Uh, Raptors in seven, Warriors in five, Celtics in seven, and Rockets in four. What about you? Yeah, uh, I have Rockets in four. I think that one's really easy. I have the 76ers in seven. Uh, I have the Toronto Raptors in seven. Okay. And I have the Warriors in five. So I think the only one we disagree on is the Celtics. Right? Yes, and so the Sixers. Right. Just on uh, But yeah, so that, that's it for the Cup 2 podcast. Once again, I'm Nick and Dan. I'm Jared Smith. And this, of course, has been the Cup